the what is the context? Uh, our region, the MENA region, is extremely vulnerable to climate change. And uh, this figure shows some of this slide shows some of the data that we have analyzed using climate data sets, unit climate data sets called RECAR. And uh, this shows a huge vulnerability in terms of water resources. Temperature is changing or temperature is increasing across the region, but there is a very big uncertainty on how precipitation is staying. And that is the source of uh, the hydrology side because water is subject to evapotranspiration and the hydrology cycle continues. And we see a huge vulnerability in the macro of Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. Uh, statistically confident uh, vulnerability. Um, but we don't see in other parts of MENA. This is the region where there is a decreasing trend of precipitation. And this is a region which was relatively humid and uh, where we have rainfall farm. And uh, then we have uh, irrigated systems in Egypt, Iraq, you can distinguish basin. Their uh, temperature is changing by increasing. So temper increasing temperature naturally correlates with the increasing evapotranspiration. So crop needs more and more water to have the same level of yield. So for example, so that what that means is that the water productivity continues to decline. So to understanding optimization of uh, crop water needs understanding of evapotranspiration in arid and semi-arid regions. Um, also, I would like to indicate that by temperature trends in different parts of MENA, uh, the, the difference between the, the long-term trends of temperature maximum and minimum temperature is also increasing and the divergence is increasing. That means the system is becoming more and more dry. So that means atmosphere needs more uh, moisture and that means evapotranspiration. That implies that evapotranspiration will increase. Seasons are also changing. So evapotranspiration is a very complex uh, boundary layer phenomena. And unlike uh, other boundary layer is a highly turbulent uh, area where uh, because of this turbulent nature of the boundary layer of the it is extremely difficult to measure a quantity of demand or energy that goes from the biosphere to the atmosphere. Okay. So this is the challenge of evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration is a, as a boundary level a meteorological phenomena that exchanges mass and energy. And uh, so there are lots of techniques and uh, different techniques at different levels of sophistications. Um, basically, I, I just as a Starting and putting this uh, in, in order to initiate our discussion, I'm starting to uh, I've put these slides together. So basically, we can understand the process of evapotranspiration as a supply and demand uh, mechanism. There is a supply of water in the soil, and there is a demand by the atmosphere, moisture, yeah, moisture demand by the atmosphere, and the the pathway of a molecule of water that goes from the biosphere to the atmosphere has to encounter a lot of resistance. It can be the and this movement of water can be through the plant, it can be directly without the plant, but the role of plant is extremely important because plants have physiological mechanism of transpiration and it is controlled by a lot of stress factors and, and this is a fundamental challenge of accurately measuring uh, actually evapotranspiration. So why we need a coordinated uh, measurement of ET in the region? Measurements of ET can be used to validate various remote sensing based algorithms that could estimate uh, remote, uh, evapotranspiration uh, so that we can have a spatially explicit uh, understanding of the ET plant's distribution. Uh, what, is the, what is the use of uh, remote sensing based ET estimation. If we have ET estimations that are uh, that we are confident about, it can be used for operational purposes, like uh, scheduling a irrigation for different farms, because we cannot 
measure each and every farm, right? So we have to rely on a scaling strategy like Rumosis. Now in uh, rainfed system, CT could be used for deciding the time and amount of supplementary irrigation. Because we see in uh, places like Morocco, uh, Rabat, uh, no, in uh, Mershu, for example, we, have, uh, we, we see that uh, without supplementary irrigation, but sometimes it may be difficult to complete a crop in, in the context of climate change. So even for supplementary irrigation, we need to be very, very judicious about the time of about the amount of water we apply. So even in rainfed systems, we may need information on uh, evapotranspiration. Of course, in uh, irrigated systems, we need evapotranspiration very much because we are adding uh, our groundwater or water from the rivers, for example. Each and uh, related variables can be used as temporarily continuous variable for validating crop models because Crop modeling is very important because, one, first of all, it will make us understand the complex process of the nature, but at the same time, can, the, these validated models can be used to study what is scenarios, like what will happen under future climate change, what will happen under management changes. For example, if we have a validated crop model in Egypt's Egypt, uh, use case, in Egypt's case, for example, then we can predict what would be the food production or food production uh, at the end of the century, for example. So these uh, planners can make uh, um, strategic planning. But we need to have confidence in such models for which we need uh, measurements. So ET can be, uh, ET and the related things. I always, when, when, I, when we talk about ET measurements, we imply the variables around it, ET, uh, Soil moisture, all those things. Although several independent ET studies exist, there is an urgent need for coordinated ET measurement with consistent measurement protocol. Everybody, uh, it's, there may be a lot of studies, but there may be inconsistencies in the protocols of adopt. One uh, one team may be using a different gathering strategy than the other. Um, they may be using different methodologies. So standardizing methodologies and protocols are very important so that we have we can have um, regionally consistent uh, estimates of ET because uh, quality assurance and quality control is very important. How uh, different teams do this is very important. Can make a big difference in the estimation. Of uh, so we usually measure ET along with allied micrometeorological data sets. So it's important. Uh, so it comes as a data package, as I mentioned earlier. And more importantly, it is a unifying micrometeorological variable that brings together different disciplines like soil science, uh, boundary layer meteorology, remote sensing, and uh, agronomy, etc., etc., soil physics. So we can have a wide community of practice. So scientists from different uh, disciplines can be brought in together. So that's the use of uh, studying ET as an interesting variable. So this Nina EG, uh, we have been discussing about, uh, we are assembled here in the context of uh, this project where we started with uh, uh, sites, initially five sites and added two more sites, Palestine and, uh, and uh, no, uh, Algeria was also interested in participating, but uh, we didn't pro uh, progress much with the Algeria site, but uh, Technically, we have six active sites in this network. Um, so my colleagues uh, will be talking in detail about the uh, different uh, data sets from these sites. So um, each of these sites have different methods. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, the, not uh, all the sites are different. Like uh, some, some, we have a decovariance in. Morocco and, uh, and Tunisia. Uh, in Lebanon, we have um, soil moisture depletion method. In Jordan, we have life signature method. Uh, in Egypt, we have energy balance method. And uh, in Palestine, also, we have soil moisture depletion method. And in addition to that, we have a cost effective um, evapotranspiration estimation by Cordoba. Uh, University of Cordoba has developed a an instrument, and uh, we also have. It's important to have such cost-effective instrument because 
it can be used to scale uh, observations of the other transmission in a call in for um, uh, in the region. So I would like to mention a, a, a bit about the data processing. In, in, the, in the protocol that we have adopted, we have three levels of data. We call it as L1, L2, and L3 data. L1 data is the half-hourly data, which, which is before that. L1, L2, and L3 data are composite data. Composite data means it is a data file that is generated from various variables uh, coming from different sources like uh, radiation variables or um, temperature variables, evapotranspiration of different types like uh, from different methods. So it is coming from different sources. That's what we call as a composite file. So L1, L2, and L3 are composite files. And L1 is the original half-hourly data, which has gaps, which has gaps. And L2 is the half-hourly data, but which is gap-filled. In the protocol, we uh, say that uh, small gaps can be filled. Like, what is a small gap? A gap which is small than three hours continuously is called a small gap. Like, if you have gaps more than um, uh, three, uh, six half hour or three hours, it's a large gap and we may, we may not be able to fill large gap. So L2 is a gap filled half, half hourly data. Then we have L3 data. L3 data is the daily data. And daily data, uh, theoretically, it shouldn't have any gap, but there could be cases when there are uh, L2 data where gaps are more than three hours. So it may not be logical to make uh, scale up, temporarily scale uh, uh, data with gaps. So those days we assume it as a gap, data, that there is a gap in the data. So L3 data can have gaps if there is big gaps in the L1 data or L2. So this is the fundamental difference between L1, L2, and L3. We always archive this L1, L2, L3 data because in the future, if there is a need of recalculation, we can again take L1 and do this calculation. That's why we don't uh, only archive L3 data because uh, we, if we do this as a final data, we may not be able to recalculate the previous one. So there is a, re a reason why we keep L1, L2, and L3 data continuously, uh, simultaneously all the time. So this is uh, characteristic features of the different data. I'm not going into details, but I would like to go through this uh, uh, flow chart where how we do this uh, QAQC and, uh, and also archiving. First of all, clear definitions are provided for L1, L2, and L3 data. Uh, and, uh, like what is, uh, what should be the characteristic feature of L1, L2, L3 data in terms of uh, gap, in terms of units, in terms of uh, other things like uh, uh, their reporting, um, their file name structure, etc. Uh, then uh, to the there is a consistent training provided to the new uh, new sites, and then uh, the, initially there is a reporting by the country coordinators. Okay, then we undergo. Uh, we evaluate the data and then we discuss the data in a WhatsApp group, peer review. And we will graph the data and see if there are serious <coughs> values, etc. This is a very important step. Peer reviewing of the data is a very important step in quality. Then we try to fix the data if there are errors and again make L1, L2, L3 data. Then we do archive, when we archive the data. So we develop high quality L1 and L2, L2 and L3 data, and it is ready for calibration validation for remote sensing purposes or with models. Um, so this is a snapshot about the different types of data distribution, uh, and uh, just showing you a glimpse of what we have. This is potentially evapotranspiration. This is active evapotranspiration for different sites. The take home message is that potential evapotranspiration is rather easier than for actual evapotranspiration. Uh, micrometeorological variables, uh, because what makes this data sets more interesting is the variables around the 
uh, anti-vapor concentration itself, because that can explain what are the governing factors that uh, made it possible to have a temporal dynamics in a particular way. We also do synthesis on how, what is the data completeness for different variables. This is an example. Uh, these are the different variables that are reported in the L3, for example. To, for the new people, I'm just giving uh, different types of evapotranspiration from different methods. Different types of evapotranspiration means evapotranspiration estimated by different methods. Okay? Then different types of different methods of potential evapotranspiration. Then we have a, a series of uh, uh, flux, uh, energy fluxes, sensible ground light. Then hydrometeorological variables, uh, precipitation, temperature. Uh, so there are additional things like leaf area index, irrigation water apply. This is because that's an important variable in the, explaining the hydrological cycle. Right? Um, then the the coordinator has to also mention what method was used for gap filling. Uh, who did that gap filling? Okay. So in the future, if there is some, it's a confusion or clarification needed, we can contact you know, when it was made. Say you are so all these are okay. part okay. of the protocol okay. that we should okay. adopt. Showing this figure shows the completeness of the data that we collected. Um, it is not updated yet, but uh, this just want to give you an idea of what we have. Some of the issues in terms of measurement, I uh, we observe that there are four main issues. Uh, first issue is the availability of a single approach. We may, may not have all the methods in all the sites, so availability only of a single approach. The second is issue could be spuriousness of the data. Some methods could be having unrealistic values, so this is uh, one example. There could be data gaps. This is an example of the data gaps. There could be divergence. This is not unrealistic pattern, but there is divergence between the different estimates. So these are the four classes of uh, issues that we have. Another issue I would like to um, indicate here is the footprint of the different methods. Anticovariance has a larger footprint, maybe depending on the tower height, depending on the wind speed and wind direction. Energy balance has a circular footprint because uh, turbulence is not necessarily involved there. So uh, one dimension energy balance has circular and depending on the tower height is again uh, different footprint. Lysing it has a smaller footprint. So footprint differences are important and this reflects the fact that we need to have very large fields, homogeneous fields, uh, so that the effect of footprint can be nullified. Um, the impact of height of measurement, crop type has an influence on the on the estimates of PT. For example, uh, sugar um, maize will be different from papa bean, it will be different from alpha alpha. If you have uh, uh, other crops like uh, date farms, it's not there yet, it gives another uh, set of challenges. So the type of crop is also very important. So I would like to make uh, some conclusion. Overall speaking, the wealth of data gathered and archived is good. The project was a success beyond the data itself, it created a community of practice with a lot of dynamism. Inter and intra site comparisons were made. Um, so, in house methods of evapotranspiration, active evapotranspiration are reasonable, and potential evapotranspiration is easier than active evapotranspiration measure. The choice of crops affects, uh, can, is uh, reflected by canopy height. And this governs the footprint of each uh, method used. Plant phenology is a very important thing. We, we need to uh, put in more emphasis on plant phenology in the future. Like so, repeated digital photography is an example to observe plant phenology in terms of leaf area index or other variables. Um, the measured data could be used. The good ones could be used for calibrating remote sensing retrievals or validating crop models. More sites, more agroecosystems, and more crops are recommended. One last uh, thing is that this data will serve as a base for validating remote sensing 
based especially explicit irrigation advice products in Egypt, for example, some of the important uh, uh, outcomes of this project, I would say. In the excellence in agronomy uh, in Egypt, we will be using the data we collected in, in the Saka station, for example. In Morocco, in the, as a part of the CGIR Climate Resilience Initiative, we will be using the data collected in Morocco to validate crop models, which eventually could be used for running models to uh, recommend policies. So, yeah, this is an, a, a, as an example of long-term modeling. In Morocco, on the shoe side, for example, uh, we can see that the yield of durum wheat will decline. But with supplementary irrigation, the vulnerability can be ex, uh, can be reduced, and uh, the vulnerability will start only from like 28. So this is an example of identifying the best climate adaptation strategy, because there could be hundreds of climate adaptation possibilities. We we need to identify which adaptation is the most effective. So for that, modeling is extremely important, and uh, to make the models confident, uh, reliable. We need to validate the 